Okay, everyone, let's get started. So, oh, what just happened? Never mind. This was just working. Okay, sorry about that. So let's get started. Um, today we are going to be talking about BERT, um, which we started discussing at the end of the last class. And we will be talking about uh, applying BERT to different NLP problems. Specifically, we'll uh, go into detail on how, do you, how you can use BERT for a question answering task. Um, after that, we will switch gears and shift from the encoder only paradigm, which BERT is the most prominent example of, to the encoder decoder paradigm, um, which we started talking about um, well before we uh, delved into BERT. Um, so the encoder decoder paradigm has its own um, pre training objectives and we will talk about the T5 objective as uh, a self-supervised encoder-decoder training approach. Um, finally, uh, if I can cover all of those things, we will talk about how we use transformers at test time um, and how that differs from the fully parallel setup that we've been discussing. To this point, we've only talked about training time, um, which is where you see the parallelization gains from transformers, but you don't see this at test time, and we'll just step through how this might work in a simple language modeling setup with a decoder-only model. Um, so before I start, like logistics, uh, your project proposals are due um, this Friday, I think, or Wednesday, sorry, um, clearly on top of things. So a number of you have already come to office hours and discussed project proposals and got feedback. Um, if you have not yet done so and you want some feedback, please, uh, you have like probably a couple uh, office hours left that you can uh, make use of. Uh, so generally how this works is you submit your proposal we will write each team like a couple paragraphs of feedback and if your idea is like it, it doesn't really make sense or it's completely infeasible given the time and compute constraints that you have, um, we'll ask you to come to our office hours and discuss a plan for making your project more reasonable. Um, someone asked like can you change your project completely between the proposal time and the final report time like can you propose one thing and do something completely different uh, we strongly discourage this and if you do do this you need to talk to us in office hours and get us to approve the new path that you're going um, and it has to be due to a good reason like maybe you found out that you couldn't train this model at all, or something else happened um, that makes your proposed project completely infeasible. Um, so yeah, any questions about the projects? Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, so you, you will submit the reports on Gradescope. Uh, there's probably not an entry yet, so I'll tell the TAs to, to make one. Other questions? Let me check on YouTube. Okay, no uh, questions on YouTube. Um, okay, and then another logistics thing. So you will have your second homework, uh, so homework one, uh, going out on Friday. So when all of these other things are due, you'll have um, a few weeks to work on that. Uh, homework one is more of a data collection homework. So you will have to get two classmates to annotate a data set for you. And then you will train a BERT on this uh, data set and see 
how well it can predict your annotations. So um, it's a good representation of the average NLP pipeline, which focuses on first gathering data, then um, you know training a model on that data, and then evaluating and seeing where the model is failing. All right, so let's get started with um, BERT. So I know we went through things um, very quickly uh, towards the end of next class, so I'll just draw out the pre-train and fine-tune um, stage again, and then we will launch into how we use BERT for a question answering test. So remember BERT is an example of the encoder only paradigm. So this means that there is no prediction of the next word going on. There is no decoder that is producing that conditional probability of the next word given all of the previous words. Um, this is because BERT has a completely different self-supervised objective, right? So during the pre-training stage, um, we are going to train with a self-supervised objective called masked language modeling. And so this is an objective in which we give the full input to the model, uh, which is why we can take advantage of the encoder. The only thing is that this input has some masked tokens in it. And the goal of this masked language modeling objective is to predict the identity of the missing tokens. Um, sorry, the mask tokens. So we can pre-train this kind of model on as much data as we want, because this is a self-supervised objective. We can arbitrarily ra mask random tokens and have the model predict this. Um, however, we eventually want to adapt this model to any task that we actually want to solve, right? Mask language modeling not generally a task that anyone cares about. Sentiment analysis, on the other hand, is a very real, real world task, right? So it's question answering. So fine tuning is the process of adapting the pre-trained model to um, a particular downstream task. And remember that downstream task here refers to a practical task that we actually care about solving, which is different than the pre-training task, which uh, is generally not what we actually want to solve. OK, so um, let's first dive into the pre-training phase, um, just uh, as a review of last time. And then we look at how flexible the fine-tuning phase can be to adapt a BERT model to several different kinds of problems. OK, so pre-training. And again, we went over this uh, kind of at a very fast pace last time. So just as a review, the first thing to note about um, BERT is that it has these special tokens in its vocabulary. So these are like the CLS token and the mask token. Um, these are special tokens in the vocabulary. The purpose of the CLS token is that it can be used at fine tuning time to uh, essentially have a single position in the sequence that you can put a classifier on to solve a downstream task. <clears throat> so during pre-training, it really doesn't have any purpose. Um, and then we have, you know, our <coughs> something like this. And um, we pass this input sequence into 
our um, BERT model, which again is a transformer encoder, right? So what goes into here is um, unmasked multi-head Right, so there's L layers of this. Uh, BERT, when it came out, was, uh, had two different sizes. There was a 12 layer version and a 24 layer version. Nowadays, the transformer models we see are far bigger. Um, so this model came out in 2018, um, almost five years ago, and now uh, we've made order of magnitude uh, improvements in uh, scale of these models. But BERT was the kind of one of the first uh, models to show that scaling up large pre-trained um, self-supervised objectives can really uh, improve performance on downstream tasks. So this model here, referred to as BERT, and um, at the end you get these vectors associated with each token in the sequence, right? We've already talked about how these vectors uh, are computed, right? They're the outputs of many deep layers of uh, unmasked multi-headed self-attention. We talked about what each of those transformer blocks entails, right? You do the attention, many heads, you concatenate the head representations together, you pass them through a feed forward layer, uh, you have the residual connections. Um, and now, uh, let's see here. So um, on the position associated with the mask token, we are going to apply our softmax layer to predict the missing word, which I guess is there. Um, right. So um, this is the pre-training objective. And uh, someone asked me after class, which is a, is a good question, so in this example I've masked one token, and I said that um, because I'm only masking a subset of the tokens and the input, this objective is strictly less efficient than the next word prediction objective. Because in next word prediction, I can put the softmax layer over every single token in the input, here, I can only put it over the mask token, right? Um, so uh, I get fewer um, contributions to the loss, and thus I might have to see more batches uh, in training in order to reach a similarly optimized model. So one question is, well, why don't I just mask more tokens, right? Uh, here, I'm just masking one token. Uh, what if instead, I decided to replace this thing with a mask and this with a mask. Now I have three mask tokens, so I can have three predictions. Maybe this will make things more efficient. So why might this not be desirable? That's right. So if I mask three of the four words in this uh, sentence, I have very little context to predict the next word, right? Um, so the only word that I have in this example is opened. There's so few constraints on what the other words could be that, um, yeah, this task is just not feasible. So what is the model actually going to be able to learn about um, language, right? Um, Similarly, though, if I stick to what I've described here, oh, lots of undos, um, and I have just one mask token, this is very inefficient, right? I can imagine having an input of, say, 500 words. If only one of them is masked, I'm not getting that much signal to train my model, right? I'm only getting one prediction for that entire sequence. Um, so the BERT paper does some experiments with different masking um, uh, percentages, uh, masking rates, and finds that 15% is kind of optimal for the trade-off between um, 
you know, like computational efficiency and also having enough context uh, for the model. There have been papers later on that suggest that maybe there are uh, higher masking rates that are better. Maybe this depends on the length of the sequence being masked and so on. Um, but yeah, people generally stick to something like 15%. Uh, this is all empirically determined. Uh, so the question is, do we need to compute all the final layer embeddings or just this one? Yeah. So if you think about how this transformer model works, you certainly need to compute all of the final layer representations for everything except uh, this layer, uh, the, the last layer. Um, and computing the last layer's representations is just not very expensive. If I just wanted to compute this one versus compute all of them, um, they're both like just fully batched matrix multiplications. So you could certainly make it smaller if you just wanted to compute it at one position, but in practice, no one really does. Um, also in general, uh, for downstream tasks, you may want access to the full uh, set of final um, layer representations. So um, yeah, it doesn't actually save much compute, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we talked about the CLS token over here as in a, a downstream task, we may want to put a classifier on top of the CLS token's final layer representation to predict some property of the input, like the sentiment. But in pre-training, it's not treated any differently from any other token other than we're not masking it during pre-training. Um, so in the original BERT paper, there actually was a separate classifier over the CLS token to do something called next sentence prediction. Um, I didn't discuss this uh, at length because it's actually not necessary. Many follow-up papers showed you can just drop this during pre-training and it has no effect on the downstream performance. Um, so the correct intuition is that the CLS token just is just one position which you can put a classifier on top to um, predict whatever the downstream task is that you want. But um, the process of fine tuning is actually the thing that is adapting this model. So the model can learn during fine tuning that, oh, I need to pool all the important uh, information about this uh, sentence into this one vector for a prediction. Um, so it really is. Sure. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, um, whether it does impact if you freeze the uh, like all of the model except the top layer. Uh, maybe it does, but uh, generally people don't do the just freeze one, one uh, freeze the whole model except one layer. Yeah, you can choose, but most people will fine tune the entire model. Yeah. Yes. During the fine tuning of the whole model on a downstream task, you can just take like the last representation. Yeah, you could. Um, it, the question is, is this arbitrary, the choice of the CLS token? Yes, it is arbitrary. It's just kind of convenient that for any given task, you always have like, you know, one special token that's set aside. But there are many alternatives. Like, you could just take the average of, whoops, sorry, on erase mode. You could take the average of all of these final layer representations and then feed them to a softmax. Or, you know, you could um, have a separate network entirely over that that pools them together. You could do many different things. Um, so, yeah, you could take the last uh, representation as well. Uh, the point is that each one of these final layer representations is fully contextualized with, with regards to the entire input. So in some sense, any of them are suitable choices, especially if the model is getting uh, adapted during fine tuning to use that particular uh, vector. Yeah.
Yeah, so this is a good question. Uh, someone asked me, I think, after a class last time, the same question. Um, so basically, the question is, well, all right, so the masking is inefficient. Um, could we, instead of just having one sequence where the word um, there is masked here, could we make, uh, I guess, four different sequences where you have mask open their books, students mask their books, and, and so on, and mask one token sequentially? You can certainly do this, but this is very expensive because each of those sequences that you constructed has to be passed through the full uh, transformer model to get to the final layer prediction, right? So it's not as easy as just saying, oh, I can just create n different copies because now you've created n different uh, completely independent training inputs. The thing about the language model decoder where you're predicting the next word is that you are sharing a lot of the computation at uh, train? You can batch all that computation across the entire sequence. In this case, you can't because you have to treat them as separate input examples. Okay, let me see on YouTube. What contextual embedding is learned for the CLS token during the mask language modeling task? Yeah, this is related to the question that you asked. Um, it's completely unclear what the CLS token is doing during pre-training time, but uh, based on the computations, it is a fully contextualized representation of the whole sentence, right? It's been through multiple uh, blocks of uh, unmasked self-attention. So in effect, during fine-tuning, those attention maths are getting kind of adjusted to solve the um, downstream task. But the CLS token, uh, at least nowadays, has no purpose during uh, pre-training. If you are interested, you can read the Roberta paper, which explores the ablation between removing this um, uh, objective strictly for the CLS token versus keeping it in, and they found that it has no effect. Yeah, you can kind of view it as the start of uh, you know, sequence token, except, um, you know, here in, we're not actually predicting any sort of sentence, so it's just more for convenience. Okay, so um, let's, uh, so this is what happens during pre-training, and uh, the objective here, just to be clear, the loss function is exactly the same as what we talked about before. Right here, we would be um, minimizing the negative log probability of there given this uh, input sequence. <coughs> and we're, we're going to use you know, backprop and gradient descent to update the model. Okay, so we talked about fine tuning then, right? So in fine tuning, my inputs are no longer masked sequences, right? Um, we gave this example of um, CLS, the movie is good. So let's say this is for sentiment analysis. And our goal here is to predict whether this is positive or negative, right? This is just a binary classification task. So we feed this into our pre-trained BERT model, right? And we get this set of vectors. But we only care about the first vector. So here, the CLS token is extremely important. In pre-training, it was completely unimportant. So we're going to put a softmax here to predict positive. So this softmax layer this is a new softmax layer. It is completely unrelated to pre-training. Um, and what, are, what is the dimensionality of this matrix here? So let's say we call this representation HCLS. Um, so then our output here, our prediction, is softmax of W Okay, maybe we can call this WS for sentiment analysis. Where this is a completely new parameter matrix and its dimensionality is 
the hidden dimensionality d by two, if you have two classes. If you have more classes, it could be you know five if you want to do fine grain sentiment, like really positive, somewhat positive, neutral, uh, you know, and the same thing with negative. Um, but this is a very flexible framework for any sort of classification problem. Um, so during fine tuning, we add one new parameter to the model, which is this softmax matrix, and we also require and this is critical, require a training data set, uh, a labeled training data set for the downstream task. So what does this mean when we're talking about sentiment analysis? It means we need a large set of reviews paired with scores in order to optimize not only the parameters of this new softmax matrix that we added, but also the parameters of our pre-trained model, the, the BERT model that we pre-trained. Is that clear? Are there any questions about this fine-tuning process? The softmax layer in pre-training is not used in fine-tuning. Yes, this is a great question. The softmax layer in pre-training is discarded. So remember that the softmax layer for pre-training is projecting that hidden state into the space of the vocabulary, right? But this is not a task that we care about when we specialize our BERT model to a particular downstream task. For sentiment analysis, we care about positive versus negative, not the mask language modeling task. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So uh, the question is essentially why, uh, oh, sorry, does BERT get worse at mask language modeling after it's been fine-tuned on a downstream task? The answer is yes. There are several papers that look into this in the context of uh, transfer learning to other tasks. Um, there's also been papers that look at you know, if you pre-train your, so you can do uh, kind of staged fine-tuning where you pre-train BERT, you fine-tune it on task A, then you fine-tune it on task B and look at the effects of, uh, you know, this intermediate fine-tuning stage. Um, there are all sorts of effects, some that can't be predicted, but in general, when you fine-tune the model, you will lose performance on the original task because a lot of the features for the original task are not important for the downstream task. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, this is a good question. So, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back to this. Um, so the question is, in this fine-tuning stage, we are only calcul calculating a loss over the CLS tokens representation. So how are all the parameters in this network getting updated? So does anyone have an answer to this? That's exactly right. So remember that the weights used to compute the CLS token, the QKV matrices, the feed forward layer, those are shared at every layer at every position of the input. So just because you have the signal only at the first position doesn't mean there are any position dependent parameters of this model, right? Um, so what your fine tuning is doing is adjusting all of the parameters of the model even though the a loss is only in the uh, first position of the final layer. Yeah, so the question is, do the initial word or subword embeddings get updated? In fine tuning, the answer is yes, all of the parameters get updated. If you see, if you see something in a paper like, we fine tune BERT, you probably can see thousands of papers that do this. Um, they're fine-tuning everything, including the embeddings. Okay, so now let's look at a slightly more complicated task of question answering. So, so far, 
like the only application of NLP we've talked about, the only downstream task has been sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is a pretty boring task, um, right? Positive or negative. Um, let's look at question answering tasks. So today we'll be looking at a very limited form of question answering called extractive question answering. So I'll spend some time talking about the task and then I'll talk about how to use BERT for this task. Uh, this is also important because uh, we will talk at length about question answering throughout this semester using progressively more powerful models and also removing some of the limitations around the task. So the version we'll see today is highly limited, um, but the version that we'll see r during the rest of the semester as, as we progress is going to be far more complicated and capable of doing a lot more, uh, answering many different types of questions. So <clears throat> the task we are talking about today is called extractive question answering. Um, and in this task, uh, you have not only a question as an input, but also a passage, um, like a paragraph from an article or something like that. So your inputs, a question, and a paragraph that contains the answer. Um, so you can already see how this is an incredibly limiting setup, right? You're asking a question, but you're also giving the model a paragraph that you know contains the answer somewhere. So practically speaking, it's not really a very useful setup. Um, or what it means is that in order to use this model, you have to first have another model that can retrieve a relevant passage or paragraph that has a high likelihood of containing the answer. So um, this kind of model is usually used in a modular setup where you have a retriever first and then when you get a passage that you're you have some confidence about its relevance to the question then you can apply this model so the expected output is um, a span of the paragraph that answers the question So usually in the case of these extractive QA systems, this span is very short. It could be one to three words. Usually the answers are like entities, so people, places, or things, or numbers, like dates, or other numerics. Um, these are very fact-oriented questions. It could be, you know, like who owns uh, some sports team or something like that. This is not a good setup for um, more complex questions like, you know, why is NLP worth learning, right? That's, that's a, a more challenging question to answer. You might want a generative model to um, capture all the possible reasons. Is this what Google uses when you ask a question and it gives you like a full paragraph? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if you've used Google search in the past couple of years, you'll notice that if you ask a question, it will, um, at least on the top page, return a paragraph or like a short snippet of a paragraph with a span highlighted uh, in that paragraph that answers that question. Um, so they, they initially did use uh, this BERT model specifically for this task, um, but now it's just not the state of the art anymore. So uh, you know they're not gonna publish exactly what model they're using um, behind search, but uh, I would expect it's some far more complicated uh, decoder language model instead of um, something like BERT. But yeah, we don't know for sure. Google did develop BERT and they did integrate it into search, not only for that task, but also for the general retrieval process. <laughs> yeah. So. You, you don't, at test time, these models are also evaluated assuming you know the gold uh, paragraph. Um, so that's why I was saying like, to actually make use of this model, 
you first need an external model to obtain that paragraph in the first place. Um, as we'll see, these are limitations that can be bypassed by different classes of models. Yeah. Oh, this is a good question. So we are talking about this in the context of encoder-only models like BERT. Can decoder-only models solve these kinds of tasks? The answer is yes, um, they can, even though they are not perhaps well suited for this task because they can generate things that are outside the paragraph as well. But ChatGPT, for example, is a very good extractive QA model. Um, many large-scale decoder-only models are really, really good at these kinds of tasks. So we'll talk about that more when we get to those kinds of models. But um, yeah, it's a good, good point. OK, so let's take a look at how we use BERT to solve a task like this. And before I continue, I'll just name some data sets that if you're interested in this task, you should um, look up. So um, the most popular data set for this is called Squad. Uh, it's the Stanford question answering data set. It was released around 2017. It has 100,000 question paragraph answer pairs. Um, after Squad was released, there were several follow-up data sets created to kind of focus on different properties of this problem. Um, there was Squad 2.0 released, I think, a year later that um, added some unanswerable questions to the data set. So these are cases where you have a question, a paragraph, and the model has to output uh, the question is not answerable from any span in this paragraph. Um, there's, so I'll put B1 and 2. There's also conversational question answering data sets. Um, so there's Quack, which is one that I worked on, and COCA. They came out around the same time. So these are kind of QA dialogues over an article, um, but they have the same format where the answer is always in the article as a span. Um, there's things like Hot Pot QA. Um, so Hot Pot QA focuses on multi-hop questions that might require you to synthesize information from, say, two passages together in order to answer the question. Um, and there's like, you know, hundreds of different data sets at this point for this task that people have created. But they all share roughly the same format. So let's take a look at an example. Um, who starred in the matrix as Neo? So this is our input question. And we have a passage that's, you know, like word one, word two, word three, blah, blah, blah. Um, then we might have a sentence like Neo was played by actor Keanu Reeves. Then we have more words after this. So we have this um, uh, paragraph and we have a span of this uh, paragraph that is the answer. So the actual format of the answer is um, a, uh, basically the start and end boundaries of the span within the passage. So maybe this is position I and this is position J and the expected output of the model is uh, the start and end uh, index of this answer. Does that make sense? <laughs> Ah. Like if somehow Keanu was in, say, one earlier sentence and Reeves some later one. Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, what if Keanu Reeves never occurred as a contiguous span in the paragraph? The squad data set and all of these other data sets do not consider cases like this. So the answers are always contiguous spans. This is a, another big limitation of this general paradigm. 
uh, a decoder only language model would not have this problem, right? Because it can generate anything even if it didn't occur in the paragraph. This uh, encoder style approach does have this limitation. So that's a great question. Any other? Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. So what is the evaluation metric? We'll talk more about that after we get through this. But in essence, the evaluation for this task is, so the model will predict a span, and you have the ground truth answer span. You can measure word overlap between the two. And um, obviously, if you got the exact span, you'll have 100% overlap. Um, if you got a partial match or something like that, you might get like 50% or something. And in general, you will average this overlap over the entire test set to get your final score. Yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah, so the question is how do you um, enter this input into the model? Now we have two different types of inputs. What, what is going on here? So let's, um, that's a good segue into the actual usage of BERT. So how do we use BERT for extractive QA? So remember, BERT is a transformer encoder. It can only take as input one sequence, right? Uh, one input sequence at a time. So here's how it works. We start with the CLS token. And let's maybe use some color coding. So uh, all right, whatever. Let's, let's not. <laughs> um, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, put in the question, who starred in the matrix, uh, whatever. And then um, we're going to use this, uh, here, this, this special separator token to denote that now we're switching um, from the question to the passage. So the separator token is another special vocabulary token in BERT. It's similar to the CLS token and the mask token. And it can be used in this case to signify that this input is composed of two distinct pieces, the question and the passage. So we're essentially concatenating the question together with the passage and feeding the entire thing into our BERT model. And now you have the passage, uh, word one, word two, word three, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Keanu Reeves. <coughs> So now, uh, remember we are using our pre-trained BERT model for this process and we're going to start with the pre-trained model and fine tune it using our large data set, say of 100,000 QA pairs. So what we do is we feed this into BERT. Remember, this is like 12 uh, transformer blocks that have been pre-trained. And of course we get all of these vectors the final layer token level representations. We don't actually care about the vectors for the question itself. We don't care about the CLS token. We start caring when we get to the passage. So here we have you know, a vector for every word in the passage. And these are the final layer token level representations. So now, what we're going to do is have two softmax layers on each token in the passage. So I will write this up here. Two softmax layers um, on each token in passage. Um, one predicts the, uh, let's say, beginning um, and one predicts the end. Okay. Sorry, 
predict beginning and end index of answer span. So how does this work? Um, basically, each one of these uh, classifiers is a binary classifier. It's predicting whether or not this token is the beginning of the answer span or whether or not this token is the end of the answer span. Um, so for the first token here, <coughs> I'm going to predict zero. This is not the beginning of the answer span. And this one is not the beginning. This one is not the beginning. Uh, this one is the beginning. So I'm going to predict a one here. And I'm going to predict a zero everywhere else. So this is the role of the beginning of um, answer span classifier. Now, if I go to the, uh, the end of answer span, I do basically the same thing. This is a zero here, and it's a one at Reeves, and it's a zero here. So you see that we have these two classifiers operating over the entire passage sequence. There's only one position where each one of them is positive, and at the other positions, they're always negative, right? They're, there's one uh, beginning of the answer span and one end of the answer span. Um, how do you mean? Oh, yeah, this could happen, say, if there are multiple occurrences of Keanu Reeves in the document, right? Um, then which one do you consider as the beginning or end of the answer span? Uh, most of these methods just bypass this problem and assume that the first occurrence of Keanu Reeves is the gold answer span. Again, this is a limitation of these encoder-only models, and um, you know, if you had a more flexible model, it, it wouldn't really be um, affected in any way by this. But you can already see that this is quite a clumsy way to have a question answering model, right? I'm basically scanning through the passage and predicting whether each token is the beginning of an answer or the end of an answer. Um, it's, it's not particularly uh, nice from an implementation perspective. So I'm talking about during training time where someone has already marked Keanu Reeves as the ground truth answer. We'll talk about test time in a bit. So uh, can you say that again? If you have a single classifier, then... Uh huh. Uh huh. But then, how would you use this at test time? So maybe when we go through the test time usage, it'll make a little more sense why we have these two classifiers. All right. Let me look on YouTube. Hey, what's up, YouTube? Today we will learn how to make a bomb out of household items. All right. I guess I'll report this. Uh, <laughs> Promotes terrorism. <laughs> All right, that was interesting. Um, what sentiment do we get after softmax for the CLS token since it's practically neutral? Uh, I think I answered that before. Like it gets adapted during the fine tuning process. Um, why do we use the CLS token at the start instead of the end? That is just an arbitrary decision. It doesn't. Um, it's what they decided to go with at, at Google. Okay, so let's continue here with um, test time usage, since that was a, a question that was asked. How do we select an answer span at test time? So here, we no longer know the ground truth answer. So what I showed up here is uh, for the fine tuning stage. So let me just write that on the side. Um, but what happens when we actually want to use this model, right? So when we want to use this model, 
what we're going to do is find the span P, uh, I guess I was using W, W, I to J that maximizes the following uh, probability So basically, I want to take the span that has the highest product of the start probability with the end probability. So why do I want to do this? Uh, oh, sorry. I should also say that there are some constraints. Exclude spans, obviously, where um, j is less than i. Those are not valid. Also, um, exclude spans longer than some threshold. Uh, this is uh, commonly done to reduce the search space. Um, also, because most of these questions have very short answers, there's no sense in looking at spans of like 100 tokens long. Um, but the question for you is, why are we looking for the span that maximizes this product of the start and end probabilities instead of just looking at the span that has the highest start and the highest, um, you know, like why can't we just, yeah? What do you mean, J condition? But these are two separate classifiers, they are completely independent. So there's no connection between the two classifiers. They have completely different parameters as well. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, would it be easier to run a model that can generate an answer? Um, this is likely true in modern NLP um, at the time that this data and this model was prob published around 2019, it was very hard to generate text uh, without artifacts. So that's why this kind of approach was preferred. Yeah, but you know, just because one span has a high beginning of um, answer probability does not mean that that is the most likely candidate for the best answer, because maybe there's just no uh, feasible end to that, uh, that span, right? So you need to consider both of these probabilities when, when making the decision. So you can see that overall this is a pretty messy setup. Like we are fine tuning in this weird way where we concatenate the question together with the passage. This is a very out of distribution input compared to the pre-training phase of this model. Um, then we're, during fine tuning, introducing these two additional classifiers. We're applying them over a particular segment of our input. And then at test time, our operation is even more different. We're looking for this product between the two um, probabilities that are given by our classifier. Nevertheless, this was the state of the art approach for extractive question answering for several years. Um, it was uh, kept getting better as people improved on the original BERT model with more data and larger scale. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that next. Um, so advanced variants of BERT. And in the past, um, we've had entire lectures about this uh, topic. And in this semester, we will just have one five minute um, like bullet point list because um, none of these is particularly relevant anymore as people have shifted more and more to uh, decoder only or encoder decoder based approaches. Um, so um, this kind of wraps up our QA portion of the class. We will return to question answering many times through the semester with progressively more complex tasks. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. By ignore, I mean we do not put this classifier on top of the, these two classifiers are not uh, placed on top of the question representations. Uh, 
Uh, so at test time, what are your inputs? You still have the question and the passage, right? Um, you need the question as part of the input, right? The, the question is what contextualizes the representations in the passage such that the classifier will be able to predict uh, high probability on the right answer span in both of the classifiers. But you, you know by definition of the problem that the answer is always located in the passage, right? Never in the question. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So what if you have multiple questions about the same passage? Um, you know, the way that this would normally be handled is you feed each of those separately to the model with the same passage as input. So you, if you have three questions, you would create three separate inputs, just swap out the question. But you are saying, what if you concatenate all the questions together? Then maybe you can assume you always have three questions about the passage and you can have six different classifiers or something like that to predict like start of first answer, start of second answer, start of third answer. Um, someone probably has tried this, uh, but again, you can see how unwieldy this is because now you have to worry about how many questions you have about the passage and how much training is your classifier going to get and so on. Yes, that's how you should be using it. Although, like, if you imagine you had a decoder-only model or an encoder-decoder model, then you could definitely put many questions into the input and uh, just expect the model could learn to generate the answers to each of those questions. So it's another reason why that kind of approach is more flexible. All right, so um, yeah, let's let's continue with these advanced variants of BERT. So. The first uh, most prominent one is um, basically some improvements during pre-training. Um, the most significant of which is more data. So they greatly expanded the amount of training data for the original BERT model, which was mainly, uh, I think, about a billion or so tokens. They expanded it by, say, an order of magnitude and saw some significant improvements on downstream tasks. Um, the other thing that Roberta did was get rid of the next sequence uh, prediction objective over the CLS token. They did a couple other things also, but the, the main um, takeaway from this paper is uh, more pre-training data is always good. And this is a, a general um, statement that applies not only to encoder-only models, but to any sort of uh, neural language model. <coughs> then we had uh, longer sequences during pre-training. So one big issue with uh, transformer LMs is that uh, you have to specify a maximum size of the input. So it's OK if the input is smaller than that size, but the input can never be larger than that size. And this is often due to com computational constraints. Um, you might run out of memory or something like that, because um, the self-attention is quadratic in its both memory and time um, complexity. So BERT was trained on um, sequences of up to 512 tokens. And um, there was a, a improvement on that called XLNet, which stretched this to about 900 tokens. <coughs> so what is 500? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's odd. All right, uh, well, it's there now. Um, okay, maybe I'll try to write and talk very slowly for the <laughs> next time. But like 900 tokens is, um, you know, not super impressive when uh, we're 
thinking about today's models where, um, for instance, GPT-3 and chat GPT can take 4,000 or 8,000 tokens and they're models that are, you know, in industry that can take even longer sequences, like say 16,000. Uh, 16, so, um, you know, a typical like book, uh, if you buy a book at the bookstore, might be, you know, 50 to 100,000 words. So uh, we're getting pretty close to having these models be able to take, you know, really, really long sequences into their input. That said, it's not clear that the transformer is the right architecture for such long sequences uh, as opposed to shorter ones. Anyway, that is a bit of a digression. So let me just start writing and then um, I'll just uh, try and fill the time here until it appears on the screen. So you can also have different um, pre-training objectives. Yeah. Uh, is it lacking an OBS for you not to share the iPad directly? Uh, what do you mean? Maybe it's just lagging because you're sharing the OBS with it, right? Yeah. Um, but like a couple of weeks ago, you were just sharing the iPad. And it wasn't yeah, that was just doing full screen in OBS. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. I'll have to look at the cord. Maybe there's something going on there, but... Um, anyway, we're getting towards the end of class, so. Um, so the most prominent of these is an alternative to mask language modeling. Yeah. I think the battery's in my Oh, 